Hello everybody and welcome back to High School Not So Much A Musical. You are listening to part 2 of a two-part series with college admissions and standardized test expert John Moscatello. If you didn't listen to our last part, here's a quick recap. We talked to John about what the college admission system would look like without the dreaded SAT, ACT, and AP tests. John's professional opinion is that colleges are already slowly starting to move toward the test optional and test blind system, making the whole admissions process more equal. We talked about how the standardized test system is inherently classist, and John agrees by remarking that you can in fact buy a higher score. We talked about the SAT and the AP program and so much more, so check out the first part if you want to hear more on that. In the second part, we will be talking about the guaranteed way to get into your dream college. We hope you enjoy. We'll get to that right after this. This is High School Not So Much A Musical, a podcast that takes you on a ride to the peaks and valleys of a high school journey. Here are your presenters, Nitin Jelodanki and Ayush Agarwal. So John, I've seen in my experience that many classes solely focus on just preparing for the AP test. And they're focused on rather than learning the knowledge and the actual material behind it, they're focusing on learning the types of questions rather than building a student's passion understanding of the subject. And I see that you have seen this disparity too, because when I was preparing for my AP Ling exam for um, my sophomore year, you were breaking down question by question exactly what they're expecting. And how is this actually testing a student's knowledge when they're just preparing for a certain type of question rather than showing their true knowledge on a test? That's a really good question. And again, you guys have to get some interviews with some college admissions people. You should try to get someone from the college board to answer this because I agree with you. I think, you know, I took AP exams when I was in high school about 20 years ago. So I'm old. And back in the stone ages, when we had like the early days of the internet, a, a lot of AP classes were less formally about test prep. Like my AP English Lang class, we didn't do any exam stuff until the last two weeks before the test. And there's still some teachers who are like this. If AP moves into the position of being the number one test in the world, a great admissions test or whatever it, it could become, then it runs the risk of poisoning 180 days of the school year with test prep. And so, you know, in Marco Learning, we do, we provide support for teachers and uh, lesson plans. And we work with, we actually work with about 250 schools around the country. So we have about 90,000 students who are in our school-based programs. And those activities, we focus a lot less on test prep because we, we don't want, you know, the, the, the ideal situation for AP is students are taking these exams, but they're spending like 160 of the 180 days of the year learning things they're passionate about. And how do we, you know, how do we re- address all these contradictions of things we've talked about? Do we need an objective standard for college admissions? Is that the SAT, ACT, or AP? If it is, there's going to be a lot of test prep happening. If we don't need that and we want to focus on joy and passion and freedom to like learn and explore, you're taking an entrepreneurship class. How cool is that? I could tell you all about it. It's intense. Don't do it, right? It's a, it's a lot of work um, running a startup. And um, that, that experience of, of learning about entrepreneurship and being excited about what you're studying and getting lost in projects and group work and creative work is something that's going to be a challenge for the AP program. And it really depends on your teachers and depends on the the culture around the AP exams. But I hear you. I think it's a very legitimate concern to raise about, about the future of the program. Yeah, and I actually have a couple of personal experiences to add to that. So one time in my freshman year, I think it's kind of ironic because it was like April of my freshman year. So like APs were just around the corner and uh, our honors language teacher was, uh, was actually reading to us a passage about kids in China and how for them, their entire college admissions process is just based on one test. So so stressful. Yeah. So it's, it's, it sucks because their entire education system is just based around studying for that one test. So 
it your entire life basically comes down to one day and whether on that one day uh you get a good night's sleep you're good to go and you perform well on that test but then uh, a kid asked the question well isn't it kind of the same here in terms of the ap exams like your entire course you're pretty much just spending the entire time doing questions and questions and questions past ap exams from that subject to prepare you for the future one and i had the same experience in calc where um to prepare for the ap exam what you basically had to do was go through the past 10 years of frqs and basically just keep on repeating it keep on repeating it keep on repeating it so that way you get that type of question um down in your memory and you basically regurgitate those same steps on the test so uh yeah those are just a couple experiences i had with ap testing being like super super geared towards solely preparing for the test rather than actually focusing on um developing passion for for example mathematics um whereas i feel like some teachers in for example ap us history our ap us history teacher was pretty good in um not solely studying or not sorry not solely making us study question formats for the test so yeah. for example um occasionally like maybe like once every couple of weeks we would for example watch a documentary about um like america the story of us or some other thing like that just to keep it interesting and just so that we could actually uh have fun while learning the subject rather than just solely focusing on preparing for the test you know yeah, and Ayush, there's a few key points you brought up there. Like one, it's as bad as we've got it. There are there are other international testing programs that are pretty intense. A lot of people are in the IB, the International Baccalaureate Program. In uh, Switzerland, you have the Matura. You have the um, you have uh, the Baccalaureat in in France. You have. Uh, rigorous programs in Italy, A-levels and GCSEs in the UK, the Chinese exams and the uh, and actually almost all the East Asian countries have insanely high pressure exams. So in the United States, like many things, is kind of parked in the middle between the Asian, um, you know, preoccupation with tests that are really life altering and the European model. So that's that's one dynamic I think that's interesting. The other that you said is again, this diversity. There are a lot of teachers out there we didn't get into teaching to do test prep. Test prep is just a thing that helps our students. We got into teaching because we like changing our students' lives. That's what I like doing with my students. Um, and this year has been really fun because a lot of the constraints on me as a teacher, I taught sixth, ninth, and 12th grade, like I didn't have to do all the same things I have to do. I didn't have to assign as much homework. So I focused on joy. I focused on something fun because we were all unhappy this year and we, we had to do that. The other thing I'll point out, and Ayush, I think you're onto something, which is I think for the college board to make the AP program better in the future, they're going to have to do even more of what they're doing with AP seminar, AP research. It's called the capstone courses, AP computer science principles, AP art, because those are not just the one exam at the end of the year, right? They're portfolio courses. You're writing stuff through the year. And even when I was in high school, 20 years ago, I thought it was stupid that an AP exam was basically offered one day a year with like a backup exam, right? So I think AP, I think if AP can be offered multiple times a year, if it can rely on portfolios and like creating work through the year, then it'll be less high pressure test prep and more of the journey, the experience of, of going through learning. And, and it might be more fun for, for you students and also again, more fun for us teachers because there, there's 3.7 million teachers in America. We had a really hard year. This was not, I know, whatever, everyone's on TikTok hating their teachers. My teacher's the worst, they say on my TikToks on Marco Learning. But um, actually, it, it was a really, really tough year for every single one of us. So the more projects and um, experiential learning and learning that isn't test prep, the, the better off and happier we're gonna be in the coming years. Yeah, I completely agree. And also you mentioned AP seminar. Uh, I actually took AP seminar like this past year in sophomore year. So I guess I can just talk uh, quickly about my experiences and that what I noticed with AP seminar was that it just built up my critical thinking and analytical skills so much right. more than other classes. Because whereas other classes, they're so focused on, you know, uh, how to answer this t specific type of question in math, 
in like calculus, for example, it's like, oh, how to answer the specific type of differential equation question or something like that. In AP seminar, everything's just so much more free and creative. Like, like in the first and second trimesters, literally every single day in class, you basically got to have a discussion with your peers about issues such as like democracy, freedom of the press, freedom of speech. Uh, we read like a book, um, I think it was Trevor Noah's memoir and like every single day in class we got to discuss on that um and even the actual ap exam for ap seminar there's like no multiple choice or fill in the blank or anything like that everything you get to craft your own argument you get to use your own evidence critical thinking skills analytical skills all of that so it's just like so much more project and discussion based that it's a completely different like experience than what you're used to in other courses that is awesome here. And in fact, I guess my question for you is like, if more of your AP classes were like that, then wouldn't your classes be better in high school? Yeah, I definitely agree. I think um, if more of my AP classes were like that, I think one, I would just be a lot more interested in school. Like I would be excited to wake up every morning and go to school. Uh, two, uh, since I would be finding them more enjoyable, uh, I think I would a be better prepared for the AP exam and B I would um, like develop a passion for each of those subjects a lot more to where I could actually be diversifying my career opportunities as opposed to just having like one really good teacher for one subject who um, makes the class super interesting and allows me to like build up a passion for one subject. Um, but I think we've been talking about this for a while. Uh, Nitin actually had a question about specific college applications and um, standardized testing, which you wanted to ask. Yeah, so going back to what you said about how the standardized testing and everything was for, it was an elitist program for white male prep schools is, is, is what you said. And using my knowledge from US history and what uh, I've gained over the past year, it's pretty clear that white people were conquering or they were the majority makeup of the US for until maybe the last century and they were always applied they were probably colleges then so i just have a quick question on which racial groups benefit the most from standardized testing the most on college applications because if there's an immigrant dad coming from india for example isn't he more clueless about the system compared to a white father who is putting his maybe six uh maybe like the sixth generation of child through college admissions. So don't you think that there is a big um, disparity between the two? And which groups do you think are most hurt by the college admissions process? Okay, so that's a great question that packs a lot of things. So let's talk a little bit about demographics, which is the study of, of population. So United States of America is still majority white. I think it's about 70 something percent white people demographically. So when you look at the, um, you know, and there's obviously a tremendous amount of change and a lot of these these boundaries are, are, are growing. We have new group, people groups, all sorts of things happening in America. Um, the, the dominance of, of white people in institutions was a function both of like the percentage of people and the way some of these systems were set up. So literally, like I'm 10 minutes down the road from Princeton University. Princeton University did not accept women into its doors until the 1970s. <laughs> um, like what? Right? Like this is so it's so ingrained that the white male was set up to succeed. And I think among white Americans, you see this wide range, this, this diversity of experiences. So you'll have, for example, that person who's, you know, somebody who's somebody the fourth whose great great grandfather was at Yale and every generation's been to Yale and that's just how it is. And then you also have other newer immigrant groups, um, for example, Jewish Americans who are newer to the scene um, in American history over the last 100 years, 120 years, and have triumphed in the university system over generations. And um, so there's this very interesting complexities in, in all of these dynamics. The way it stands now, there are certain, I think it is accurate to say that there are certain groups of people geographically, uh, by gender, by ethnicity, and by money who are favored and disfavored. For example, we know that female students are very much disfavored in the process right now because of how successful female students have been. 
Um, and what I mean by that is like the percentage of female students who graduate on time, their average GPAs, the disciplinary issues, all of it from middle high school and higher ed, women outperform men throughout. And there are many colleges in America that are 60% female, 40% male. And if you're applying as a female applicant, you're at a disadvantage. Um, so that's one demographic group we look at. And, and by the way, I think it's something like 57% of all college students are female and 43% are male. So there's a lot of colleges where females have a higher average uh, standardized test scores than, than males. Among ethnic groups, we see generally that standardized test performance, grade performance, and college admissions kind of cluster together. The highest performing standardized test scores across almost every category of standardized tests are Asian American students. Um, that's just how the statistics work. The next category underneath them are white, and then it works uh, Black and Latino students, Latin American students, and Native American students. So those, those categories kind of track across the spectrum. And there are some groups who um, are, are just disadvantaged um, specifically. And that's, that's why we've seen in recent years, several um, Asian American groups file lawsuits against colleges saying they're being discriminated against. You'll even hear schools and places say either under their breath or out loud, we don't want to become too Asian. That sounds on its face to be racist to me. Um, and that, that's a dynamic as well. Um, so, and I, for example, in New York City, there's Stuyvesant High School. There's been a big debate about using standardized tests and the percentage of, of each ethnic group. I think, again, among wealthy and poor, you'll see some, some attempts to correct the balance for first-generation students, for students who are English language learners, who um, are applying for Pell Grants that shows financial need. And then those tracks I mentioned earlier, students whose parents are, are cutting checks to colleges or who have these advantages. So it's, it's a very complex um, system. I think it's unfortunate that those realities exist. And I think there, again, there are a lot of people trying to fix them. I'll give you one last one. You both are in California. I'm in New Jersey, two very populous states. New Jersey is the densest state in the union. A student applying from central New Jersey is kind of one, there's like one in a million, right? There's a lot of, uh, or I should say, there's, there's, a, there's a large crowd applying out of central New Jersey. There's a large crowd applying out of central New Jersey to NYU and Fordham and Columbia and UPenn and the places around New Jersey. If you are an applicant from the state of Idaho, applying in to the University of Pennsylvania, you have a much better shot all things being equal than the student from New Jersey. So there's a, there's also a geographic disparity mixed in. And you have to take all those things I mentioned, gender, money, ethnicity, and geography, all those demographic factors, and see how do they all converge on one application. And that's why I don't have a, a simple answer for you because it's, it's, it's very complicated. Um, trying to figure out exactly how we make this system as fair as we possibly can. Yeah, um, it's obviously very tough to take all those factors into consideration, um, but I think colleges have made several attempts to do that in the past, uh, one of them actually being the affirmative action system. Uh, uh, so John, I was wondering if you would like to talk a little bit about you know, the affirmative action system, what are your thoughts on it, uh, what do you think the future of affirmative action is, who does it benefit, which ethnic groups does it benefit, which ethnic groups does it hurt, etc. Yeah, so that's a great question. Affirmative action is an interesting story in college admissions. Again, lawsuits that have come up in recent years all the way up to the Supreme Court. And you think about the moment in which affirmative action was created and, and where the idea comes from. Brown versus the Board of Education was in 1954. Up until then, in Topeka, Kansas, where that's the board, it's the Brown versus the Board of Education in Topeka, Kansas. In Topeka, Kansas, if you were a young black student, you went to the junkie school with worse facilities, with less educated teachers, you rode worse buses, you had less access to everything. When the Supreme Court struck down school-based segregation in the 1950s in Brown, we saw a change in the opportunities for black students in areas. We saw, surprise, results go up over the next couple of decades. Affirmative action was an attempt to rectify 
a couple centuries of that inequality and injustice. And I think it makes tremendous sense from the perspective of like, it's it, it, on the one hand, critics of affirmative action will say, well, you're giving some people this unfair advantage. And the defenders of affirmative action say, well, wait a second, there's unfair advantages baked into the system already. And you've mentioned some, uh, Nitin, you had the uh, you made the point about if your parents have come over to this country um, and are new immigrants, they don't have the advantage of that of that knowledge of how college admissions works or that legacy seat at Stanford that's really going to help you get in. So affirmative action was designed to address what we all agree are fundamental disparities. The question is, what fundamental disparities continue today? What does that look like? And does um, does is affirmative action working to create outcomes? Because what the Supreme Court had ruled and what still holds as national law is that if that a college has every right to pursue diversity as a goal, if you if you've got fifty thousand applicants to your very competitive college and there's two thousand seats, yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Let's have a diverse class. Let's have a class that's you know, 50% male, 50% female. Let's have a class from all 50 states. Let's have a class full of musicians and athletes and artists and sculptors and entrepreneurs and computer coders. And let's have an ethnically diverse community. And that's, that's the justification for using ethnicity and race to in the college admissions process. Uh, yeah, so I think that makes sense in terms of um, affirmative action being used as a tool to rectify past harms against uh, minorities such as uh, black and brown people. Um, John, what do you think of like the quota system within affirmative action? I don't know if you've heard of this where um, I'm pretty sure the Supreme Court has ruled that yes, colleges are allowed to use the system of affirmative action and say, um, look, this person was black or brown, so then when growing up, they had to face uh, systemic racism, racial inequalities that um, they otherwise would not have had to face if they were uh, white, and they were still able to do so well despite those inequalities. But what colleges are not allowed to do is say, in a particular given year, in a particular major, let's just take the example of computer science, colleges are not allowed to say, in this computer science class of 2023, we're going to have at least 10% of the acceptance be black. Um, I was wondering what you thought of that type of quota system saying, um, saying essentially, yeah, we want some of these people, at least a specific amount to be a certain ethnicity. That's a great question, I And I think it's really interesting because colleges will say, yeah, we, you know, we don't have uh, quotas. We don't use these percentage percentages. Well, why are your percentages the same every year in a lot of things? Like you shockingly, you ended up with exactly 50 50 split in gender or you ended up with these uh, sort of astonishingly stable numbers. So I think, you know, it may be that the applicant pools don't change that much year over year. But, you know, how people, we're really talking about sorting, how people sort themselves and how they are sorted by others. And actually, there's, there's really a thousand little decisions that go in along the way. You may say, I want to major in English literature or computer science or whatever it is. The reason, the factors that brought you there are related to gender, ethnicity, class, geography, what your parents say, what your parents don't say, what your parents say you shouldn't do and can't do, and what your uncle says. All these people are kind of in the story and they are shaping the way that you set goals. Your teachers and your guidance counselors and AP coordinators and assistant principals and all these people in your life are also shaping you how you're sorted. They're putting you into an AP class or they're not. Or they're saying you should try out for the volleyball club or the newspaper. That sorting is happening there. And then college admissions officers are also doing sorting. And again, it just so happens that as a country, we seem to sort ourselves in remarkably stable ways. And if I'm not mistaken, something like 80% of all college uh, computer science majors are male students. How is that? Is it that 
from a young age, we're telling boys that they can be computer programmers and we're telling girls they can't be? Is it because of the way parents are putting expectations in? Does it have to do with class and ethnicity and our colleges, how our colleges react? So I'm you know, answering your question with another question because I don't really know, know how it is that we, all those forces conspire together to create these kinds of results over time. So I think that those were some really good answers and it kind of gives us a better understanding of how all these systems came to be and what their true effects are. And I loved the fact that you kept on bringing up NYU because Ayush knows this very well. I'm obsessed with NYU and it's probably like (laughs) my number one school that I really want to get into. And um, just to tie all of this together for the listeners and for Ayush and I, do you have any final tips about the college admissions process, standardized testing and everything in general, the the whole high school life? Yeah, my advice to all of you is this. And this is, you've heard this advice before, maybe from like a Disney movie or whatever, but it's true. Do the stuff you want to do that isn't illegal, right? Like college admissions officers have been begging high school students across the country, please just do the stuff that you love, parentheses, that is legal. Because the stuff you keep, everyone keeps thinking, well, colleges will really like to see my penmanship. No, they don't, they won't. They'll really want me to take four sports or whatever, not three. Or they really want me to do physics one and not physics two. Like you're overthinking it. Do the stuff you love. You like AP seminar, take research or however that works. You like uh, you like Spanish, take do the Spanish program over the summer. You like writing, write, try to get yourself published. Entrepreneurship, get an internship. Do the things that you love and enjoy, and it becomes so much more liberating than prepping for the next test, going to the next thing. Because here's something that's fun to to, to think about. NYU is great, and New York City is amazing, and you, but you got two more years in your high school career that are also potentially awesome, right? High school is not just your ticket to college, it's an end in itself. So my advice to you is do all that stuff and be in touch with me at Marco Learning. Right? So we, we on our social media accounts, we put out tons of great uh, updates, infographics, words of encouragement like that, right? That we, we, we want to remind students, you are more than your standardized test score. You are more than your parents' expectations. You are more than some fake rule you made up in your head about what you think college admissions is. College admissions officers want you to be real. They want you to be excited about the things that excite you and they want you to thrive in high school. And so do I. That's why I do what I do every day. I want I want you to, the two of you, by the way, this is a great podcast. Thank you so much for hosting me. Uh, I want all your listeners out there to be free from all the noise and all the pressure and anxiety. We've had the worst year ever over the last year and a half with COVID as it seems like there's light at the end of the tunnel this is all ending let's take our our excitement our energy and be free from the pre-covid world and make a better one in these months and years after this is over awesome thanks a lot for your time john we got some really nuanced and interesting discussions out of it for concluding thoughts as john said don't just do something because society or some random college admissions officer in a random city might like it go after something because you genuinely enjoy it and think you can succeed in it to the listeners, make sure you subscribe to us on YouTube at High School Not So Much Musical and follow us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you're listening to this episode. See you all in future episodes where we'll be talking with the CTO of OnRobot, a multi-million dollar collaborative robotics application company and potentially the host of NPR Marketplace. Thank you so much for joining us on this episode of High School Not So Much a Musical. And a big thank you once again to John Moscatel. That's our show for today. Now roll the credits. High School Not So Much a Musical is hosted by Ayush Agarwal and Nitin Jaladanki. Narration by Samhit Padala. Music from Louis Luong Relaxation Cafe, Tune Pocket, and Infraction. If you like this show, please recommend it to your friends and family. Thank you for listening and see you next time.